welcome to meet your, F your efficient neighbors who heat and cool their homes with heat pump technology. Take it away, Craig Foreman. Thank you, Marcia. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, my name is Craig Foreman. I'm the Heat Smart Newton coach. I'll be telling you more about Heat Smart Newton later. And this program really started out as an idea that we do a house tour and we'd have people that had have heat pumps in their homes, open up their homes for people to come in, look around, talk about their heat pumps. And of course, with social distancing, we can't do that, but we're still doing it. We're just doing it virtually. And you're gonna get to, to meet four of your neighbors and you're gonna hear about their systems and they're gonna, they're gonna tell you about their systems and you're gonna get to ask questions. So any questions you have, um, put in the Q&A uh, um, link that you have at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to them. We'll have questions after each speaker and then we'll have some at the end as well. Um, I'm gonna start off, and the format's gonna be, I'm just gonna start off and tell you about heat pumps, what they are real quickly. Uh, I'll introduce the Heat Smart program. I won't take too long, and then I'll introduce our first speaker, and we'll go from there. Okay. So um, this is this is a basic heat pump diagram, and I'm going to walk you through this. You don't need a physics degree to understand this. We're going to try to make it simple for you. There's there's two main components. The way I look at a heat pump, there's what we call the coolant, which is this blue or red like line that runs all the way around this thing. That's what we call our coolant line. Some people call it refrigerant. We used to use Freon for this, but Freon was banned in 2010 for anything new. So we use a different coolant now that's called Puron. Freon was very bad for the ozone layer. Puron is better. It's still bad. And probably in a few years, we'll have another coolant we'll use. But this is a closed system. The coolant that runs in the system that runs around doesn't leave. It shouldn't leave. It should, there shouldn't be leaks. It stays there and it runs all the time and hopefully it won't escape into the atmosphere. The other big component is the compressor and that's the, this disc shaped thing in the center. When you compress anything, it, it, it gets hot. If it's got a limited volume and you, and you push on it, it gets warm. So when we compress the coolant, it turns very hot. And when you turn something hot, it boils. That's just like if you heat a pot of water on your stove, it turns into steam, it's boiling. So what happens is this refrigerant comes into the compressor, it gets compressed, and that's where all most of the electricity in your heat pump goes, it goes into the compressor. It comes out as a gas and it comes out hot. And it gets over to this red side, which is the hot side, and we could call that a heat exchanger. They, they call the hot side the condenser. And in this side, usually we have a fan that blows this hot air out, and that would be the hot side. The, the uh, coolant continues down and it goes through what's called an expansion valve. And when you relieve that pressure, all the, he the heat uh, is turned into, it, it gets very cool. So the heat goes away and it becomes cool. And when it cools down, it changes form from gas to liquid. So now you have a cold liquid running into the other side of this thing, which is also a heat exchanger, except this is the cold side. And we normally call this the evaporator. And then you put a fan behind this and that can blow cold air out and it gradually starts to warm up and it may turn into a gas again, where it enters the compressor and the whole cycle starts over again. And that's the basic idea of how a heat pump operates. Now, some people would say, well, I don't know, I've never seen a heat pump, but you all have one. It's your refrigerator. If you look at this diagram of what's inside a refrigerator, it's all the same things we just talked about. Um, you have your coolant line, you've got your expansion valve, you've got your co compressor at the bottom, and it's just a heat pump, but this one is taking heat from the inside of your refrigerator and moving it outside of your refrigerator. If you put your hand around the back of the refrigerator while it's running, you'll, you'll feel that it's warm because it's removing heat from one place and putting it out in another place. In this case, it's putting, taking it from inside the refrigerator to outside the refrigerator. Now, when we use heat pumps for heating and cooling, it's the same components. 
the compressor is located outside, okay? And so I've shown two drawings because heat pumps, one of the great things is they can be used for cooling and heating. The way we do this is, is we have a, a reversible valve that can change the direction, change the direction of flow of the coolant lines. So in the summer, when you want cooling, okay, you have the hot air uh, leaving from the outside unit where the compressor is and cool air is being blown into your home to help cool you down. When we reverse the flow of the coolant, it works the other way. In this case, we're, we're taking heat from the outside air and we're bringing it in to the, to the home through the coolant lines and a fan forces that warmer air into the home. Now, many people have trouble understanding how we could possibly take heat out of a cold winter day and heat our homes with it, but you have to understand that even if it's zero degrees outside, there's still heat in the, in the air that we can extract with a heat pump. Now, it's not as efficient as if that air was at 45 degrees or 50 degrees, but it can still run and it will still run and it will still be able to heat your home. Um, there's several forms of what we call air source heat pumps for heating and cooling. And the reason we say air source is because the heat is coming from the air that's outside of the heat pump. There's another form of a heat pump, which we're not gonna talk about called ground source heat pump, where you actually drill a very deep hole into the ground and you, and you extract the heat from, from deep underground. It's a more complicated system. You have to bring a drilling rig in to, to do such a system, but it's a great way to do it. We're just not gonna be talking about those tonight. So these are the different kinds of air source heat pumps for heating and cooling that we are gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna to talk about ductless mini splits. And we say ductless because that's what they are. They don't have ducts that run through your house that bring cold or hot air into different rooms. What they do is they have a compressor that's outside of your house that does that compressing. And that's where the work gets done. And we have coolant lines that run inside the house to one or more um, heat exchangers and this is shown as a single zone system where we have one compressor and one wall mounted heat exchanger. And this one's located on the wall up near the ceiling, which is a very common way to do them. Now you can take these uh, compressors, you would have to have a little larger compressor, but you can run multi uh, heat exchangers off one compressor. For instance, you might have in the picture, you can see there's a, a unit that's a floor mounted unit, there's a wall mounted unit, there's one that goes up in the ceiling between the joists, and this is another unit that's pretty versatile, it's called a slim duct system. But you can run up to three or four of these off one compressor, and you can heat and cool different rooms in your house. And the beauty of this is each of these uh, heat, ex these, each of these air handlers or heat exchangers, you might say, has their own control. You can have them set at different temperatures. The other type that we'll talk about is what we call a central ducted system. Now this is more like you might be familiar with with the central heating system or central air conditioning system. You've got a big compressor that's located outside and you've got a big heat exchanger that's located inside and you have large, you know, you have duct work that leaves that and will, and will be distributed throughout your house to distribute either cold or hot air. Remember, all heat pumps can do cooling and heating, so you can use them for both. They're useful all year round. Now, the central ducted systems are really good if you already have ductwork in place in your house and you can replace it with a heat pump, and that's what's shown here. Or if you're doing perhaps a new construction project, or if you're doing a complete renovation of your house. The, the only issue is uh, it's as a central system, we have one thermostat and everything's kind of at the same temperature, kind of like a central heating system or a central AC system. You don't have individual control in every room except for maybe closing or opening the louvers on the vents in each room. That's, that's one thing that this can't do that, that the mini splits can do. Sometimes we'll even have both styles in one house. For instance, if you, if you 
it's very hard to add ducting like on a first floor if you have a multi-story house, but you could get up to the attic and add ductwork up there and you might put a central uh, heat pump up there to serve the second floor and maybe you might use mini splits on the first floor. So there's a lot of combinations of the way we can use this technology and you're gonna be hearing from four people tonight that are gonna to talk to you about their particular installations and you'll have a chance to ask them questions. We also use this same technology in water heaters. And this water heater looks very similar to any water heater you'd have, but it's very different inside because the top part of this has all the same components we saw in the heat pump. It's got the compressor, the expansion valve, um, you know, it's got, it takes warm air in from around the, uh, the water heater and it uses that, it extracts heat from that to heat a big tank of hot water and that's what you very efficiently heat your hot water. And this is of course all electric and it's very efficient and it exhausts cold air. So it's pulling heat out of the air that's around the hot water heater and using it to heat that tank of hot water. And we're gonna to talk to some residents who have these in their homes. Now, Eat Smart, Cool Smart is a program that's a City of Newton program. It's not a Green Newton program, it's a City of Newton program. The City of Newton received a grant from, um, from two state agencies to, um, to use, to uh, educate the public about it and to promote heat pumps. And, and the city of Newton is being helped out by three of our very strong environmental organizations being Green Newton, Mothers Out Front, and 350 Mass Newton Node. This is the same model we used when we rolled out the Newton Power Choice program. It works very well. So HeatSmart has been around for, this is the third year. They've been in 13 communities. You don't see 13 flags on this map because some of the communities combined together if they were smaller, but they've been everywhere from Great Barrington out in Western Mass out to Nantucket. And uh, there's been some 463 contracts signed as a result of the HeatSmart program. And these are the two state agencies that manage this program. So how does HeatSmart or how can HeatSmart benefit Newton? Well. What we hope to do is educate the community on what we call electrification of the home. Electrification of the home is what we need to do ultimately to move away from burning fossil fuels in the home. And if you're involved at or have heard of the Newton Climate Action Plan, this is a very central point in the Newton Climate Action Plan. We have to start getting to electrification of the home. We need, to under, we need to increase understanding about the benefits of how we can use this technology, which is efficient heat pump technology. It's electric technology, but it's not the old style electric heating you might be familiar, familiar with. This is modern, efficient heat pump technology that can do both heating and cooling. And we want to encourage the adoption of this technology in our homes. Then we like to be able to connect people with vetted, reliable installers. This has been a little bit of a problem because installers haven't been going into homes. They've been running on kind of skeleton crews doing emergency work only. We haven't been able to get to this point yet where we have vetted reliable installers, but we will. And we hope to squeeze a little bit of time and a little bit of cost out of anybody's heat pump projects through these negotiated contracts with our partner installers. Finding an installer is sometimes difficult. It takes a lot of time. We want to make that a little bit easier. And by having contracts, we're going to have the pricing as, as transparent as it can be. And also another important thing is homeowners educate other homeowners. They educate their neighbors. If you see your neighbor doing a project, you ask them about it, you learn about it, and that's, that's how we spread the word about this stuff. And it really does work that, well that way. So the technologies that we're doing as part of Heat Smart Newton are all the ones I showed you. It's all the ductless mini splits. These are the ones that we, we talked about and central ducted systems. So our installers will be able to do any or all of these or any mix and match of these. We are also gonna promote the heat, smut, the heat pump, what they call hybrid hot water heaters. And in order to get started with heat pump, you're, you're, you're already starting by attending this webinar, you're getting educated. Listen, everybody's gonna have to go through cycles where they replace their components of their utilities. Hot water heaters, maybe every six to 12 years. Heating systems last longer, maybe 20 to 30 years. So 
by the time we get to 2050, when we hope to have a carbon neutral Newton, everybody's going to have the chance to replace these utilities. And we hope that when that time comes for you, you'll think about heat pumps and you'll think about using some of this technology. Heat Smart Newton has a website. You don't have to write this down. You can just type Heat Smart Newton into your browser. You'll get to it. We have lots of great information up there. We will have a video of this um, presentation up there in a few days. And we have Newton Heat Smart, Heat Smart Newton coaches like myself who are here to answer your questions. We have an email address. It's just heatsmartnewton at gmail.com. Send us your questions. We'll try to answer them. We also have a hotline. If you don't want to use email, you can call and leave a message. We'll call you back. And we hope that you'll consider using our vetted installers when we have them. We hope that after July 4th, we'll be at a point where we'll have our installers selected and, and vetted. And at that point, hopefully um, you can make use of that. But in the meantime, there's lots of education that we're doing and we, you know, hope to get a lot of people educated. At this point, I'm going to ask, I don't see any questions that have come in. And if there aren't, if you have a question, type it in. If not, we will go on to our first presenter. I'm going to stop my share. Uh, I got one question that's just come in. Um, what are the top three barriers preventing people from changing their HVAC to heat pump? So I would say one of the barriers is that natural gas, which many people use in Newton, is very, very cheap right now. It's almost too cheap. We feel like in the future, we might get to a point where we have um, perhaps, you know, a carbon tax on things like fossil fuels, and it might not be as cheap as it is now. But that's definitely a barrier because another uh, barrier is that the technology is expensive. Um, and so you have to make a commitment. You have to look out a few years. You have to look out at what you're doing for the environment and you have to look out at what you're doing, you know, as far as how you use fuel and how you save fuel. As a third barrier, um, it's just not, it's just not being familiar with the technology. It's not new technology. It's been around for a long time, but people don't really think about it as much um, for heating and cooling. Any other questions before we go on to our first presenter? Oh, I got one more here. What's the best way to educate people and promote? Well, um, edu education is all over the internet. I mean, we have education through Green Newton. There's many, many other groups. Um, the installers, are very knowledgeable and they will help educate you. Um, and uh, this, this technology is getting more and more popular and you'll, you'll hear about it, you can read about it and just, um, it'll be, it'll be, well, there's lots of education available, but I think one of the best ways is people talking to people. That's kind of what we're doing tonight. I'll take a couple more questions. Um, what happens to steam radiators after installing heat pumps. Okay, if you have steam radiators and you install heat pumps, you're not going to use those steam radi radiators with your heat pump systems. Many people will keep their what we call the legacy heating system in place. Um, and you might use that on really, really cold days when it drops below zero just as a supplement. You can remove them, but you wouldn't use your steam radiators as part of the heat pump. You could use them as part of your legacy system on a really cold day. I'll take one more. Um, do the installers have any experience in zoning existing ductwork on an older two-story home? Yes, the installers are very familiar with the kind of houses that we have in our area. They're very familiar with the kind of ductwork that can be reused and can't be reused. If you have the very tiny uh, high pressure air conditioning ducts, those aren't going to work. But if you have like a hot air heating system or a regular central air conditioning system, those ducts most likely will be able to use. It depends on the, the condition they're in and so forth. I'm going to at this point not take any more questions. Uh, yes, excuse Martha? me. I'm, I just want to say that we do have more questions and perhaps the other uh, presenters might be able to answer some of those questions. Yeah, and you're going to hear about different systems from the different um, presenters and you can ask them questions about their particular system. So I'm going to start off by introducing our first presenter, Chris Vitor. He's a local realtor here in Newton. He's also a volunteer as part of the Heat Smart Newton program. And Chris, you can um, take the screen and share your 
pictures or whatever you have. And, and this right. is kind of free form. My people are just going to talk about what they want to talk about. It's, there's not, it's not an interview. So Chris, go for it. All right. Hope everybody can hear me. Okay. Craig, am I coming in loud and clear? Coming in yeah. fine. All right. Great. So, um, Firstly, I'm a uh, West Newton resident. Um, I grew up locally. I'm married, and we have two little little ones, two boys, a uh, four-year-old and a nine-year-old. And a nine-year-old goes to school at Horace Mann. We live on Mossman Street, which is um, a couple blocks north of the Pheasanton School. And we live in a Campanelli Ranch, which um, they were built in the 50s. It's a 50s ranch. It's an L-shaped ranch. I don't know if you guys can see this picture, but it's about 1,800 square feet. And we bought it four and a half, five years ago. Um, and one of the things that my wife and I really wanted to do was try to live in a highly efficient home. Um, I studied environmental science when I was younger, and I want to be a role model for my kids and for our whole community and for my clients too. That was a, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a real estate agent, a full-time real, realtor here in Newton. And I wanted to be an educator and I thought a great way to uh, educate on, on efficiency and green energy was just to set a good example and, and be able to talk, talk about, my, uh, about my tech and uh, by learning about building science within my own home. Um, so uh, about two years ago in 2018, um, we, we were super tired with our heating system. We had an oil-based uh, hot, water, hot water baseboard system and no cooling. Um, it was on oil. There was no gas line on our street. And um, I didn't want to install gas anyways, because I, I knew that was dirty and I wanted to get away from fossil fuels. So my wife and I um, had a mass save energy audit and started talking to friends and colleagues that knew a little bit more about um, solar power and about heat pump systems. And we settled on a central style um, heat pump system. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, I'm actually going to, this is actually our system right here. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's on the back side of our house. It's like the size of a small car. It's a very large condenser. So everybody's seeing a condenser, like air conditioning condenser. Well, this is bigger than that. Um, and it sits on a platform. Um, it's very clean looking. Ours is a uh, is manufactured by carrier so it's a carrier green speed model which we were assured was the the best system on the market at the time and it essentially um so we removed the whole baseboard system for our entire home removed our oil tank um removed our hot water heater we installed this and we installed duct work in our attic and then we got a um, ream hot water heater which is a, a ream heat pump hot water heater so we've got one of those too so technically we have a, a hot water heater for one which sits on the top of the tank the tank is i think this is the water tank right here and then this is the heat pump for the hot water tank and then we have a condenser on the exterior and we have an air handler in our attic and then just duct work throughout the whole home um so um the company that that provided us the system or installed the system was a company called Suburban HVAC out of Westwood. I I knew them. I had familiarity with them. They assured me that they that they knew a lot about these systems and, and that this was uh, what I should be using or installing. Um, and overall, I think it was really great. The technicians did a super job. The salesmen were not very educated on the technology. Um, it's still fairly new and, um, and I, didn't, I didn't really get the sense that they were installing a lot of them. So I don't, I don't think this is very, um, it, it felt very, very cutting edge at the time. Um, and like we were, we were a little bit rolling the dice, um, but it honestly, it ended up being really smooth in the end. It took about a week for them to gut our HVAC infrastructure and install a new infrastructure. Um, the system itself, so including, so again, our home's like, a, like 1,850 square feet, um, to gut the whole infrastructure and install all this new technology, it costs $32,500, but a lot of that was the removal too, and the duct work. So I think Craig said before in his presentation that 
um, you can work off of an existing ductwork system. So if you have central heating and cooling in your home, you can use that existing or legacy ductwork for an exterior condenser style whole house heat pump system like this. Okay. Um, so we, we paid $32,500. We got a $2,000 rebate. Um, and as I recall, we financed 28,000 of it through mass save at 0% interest to be paid back over seven years. So mass save has like an, a pretty incredible loan program for heating and cooling and windows and insulation. Um, and we took advantage of that. I'd, I'd rather our money be sitting in the bank um, or in other kinds of investments. And we just basically took on a small mortgage for this system, but it was a 0% interest loan. Um, and again, it's to be paid off over seven years. We have no backup heating system. So it is our one and only heating system. We do have a uh, wood burning fireplace, but I think, I think in reality, if you insulate your home well enough, um, uh, like kind of throughout within the attic and, and in the siding of the home, um, that's going to kind of serve as a, as a fail safe. And that's been our fail safe. We haven't lost electricity in the last couple of years. I, I can't tell you whether it's going to be a problem in the future. How am I doing so far, Craig? Okay, I think you're muted. But so when they when you know it, you know fine. Doing okay. So when they gutted our our uh, system, you know, they put everything out on the front lawn, <laughs> and then they I thought you guys would get a kick out of these photos. I found them this afternoon, and then you know the crew just set up on the driveway, and but it was a you know a, not not a terrible experience. Um, in terms of problems that I've had, I would say um, the only problem that I have had is that water dripped off of um, the back of the gutter and landed here and froze. And it seized up the system. So this happened about a year and a half ago. And we didn't, re it, was, it was during a very, very cold winter and there was a ton of snow. And um, we went for about a month without realizing that it was seized up. And so we were running our home off of just straight electric heat, which is very expensive. And so that month, I think it was like $1,000. It was, it was really, really expensive um, for heating and cooling and electric that month. So, um, but outside of that, I haven't had any issues. So the moral is keep, keep, keep it clear of snow if you can, right? Yeah, you really do. You need, like we actually installed, I don't know if you can see it, but we had our handyman kind of install a, a pretty simple, um, like a panel above it, like a little overhang, just so that the snow would slow off of that and then miss the condenser. Um, what, you know, what do I like best about this? I, I really, it's really important to me that I be a role model to my kids and to my community and that I be on the right side of history and climate change scares me. And I think it's, you know, a huge, I think it's the biggest, uh, you know, thing that we're dealing with right now worldwide. And I, I see no better solution than to be a teacher and set a good example. Um, my next steps are to, uh, if we put on a 50 year uh, architectural roof last year, and then it will be to install solar and then to plug in cars. And we use Newton Power Choice. So 100% of our home uh, heating, cooling, and electric is run off of green power. And we pay a slight premium for that over the oil alternative. Um, but we're proud that we do that. So, and, and Chris talked about those financial incentives. That's about it. There are rebates available for heat pump systems both heating and cooling and hot water. They're very different depending on if you're coming from gas, coming from oil, coming from electric heat, but there's, there's, there's a lot of things available. We have information on our website, on the Heat Smart Newton website about those. And the heat, the heat loan program is still active. You can take uh, loans up to $25,000 at 0% interest for seven years. So those are great. Any questions that you wanna ask Chris before we go on to our next, um, our next presenter, just type them in now. Wait a second. There are a couple here, Craig, so I'm happy to try to tackle them. Oh, I see them. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. The, what's, okay. 
um, he, somebody wants you to talk more about water heaters. Um, well, well, one thing here, it says here, what's the additional burden of, of a home's electrical capacity with a mini split? Um, I don't believe, so as I understand, I'm not, I'm not a contractor, but as a realtor, what I understand is that when you run a normal heating system, 100 amp service for your standard 2000 square foot colonial might be okay, but that if you're gonna have any sort of cooling, you're gonna require 200 amp service. And so we have a, a whole house central uh, ducted system and we have 200 amp service. And of course, if it's possible to do solar, that's great. <laughs> yep. Um, um, Chris, uh, where do the ducts from the heat pump water heater go? You showed the ducting on your heat pump water heater. And everybody should know that you don't always have those ducts. You can use ducts or you cannot use ducts. You want to talk about that, Chris? Yeah, so the ducts, um, all of our duct work is in our attic for our heating system. And that's where the air handler is as well. And then the condensers outside. Um, but we have like a utility room on our first floor and that's where the heat pump is and it vents to the exterior. But I think you could have that in the basement as well. Right, so, so if you wanna take air in from the basement and blow out cool air into the basement, let's say in a, like a utility room, you wouldn't need ducting at all. If you wanna take that cold air and blow it outside, you blow it out through a dryer vent. And in, in this case, Chris has done that, but you don't have to use ducting. It all depends on the installation. What else do we yep. have? Average cost per month in the winter and the summer, any idea? Yeah, I actually um, pulled numbers. So, um, oh shoot, I actually don't have numbers. <laughs> Sorry, okay. but, I, but I can tell you that our costs are higher than they were when we had oil and electric, but we have in, now we have cooling too. So our total, um, our total electric and a total electric cost last year for our home, which was heating, cooling, and uh, electrical, was forty three hundred dollars. Um, and two years ago, or three years ago, two thousand seventeen, when we had oil and electric but no cooling, it was thirty one hundred. So it's like I've adopted a twelve hundred dollar increase in bills, but I'm now cooling my home for, you know, three and a half months a year. And I'm going to take one more. Chris, do you find your heat pump noisy? I've heard that heat pumps may be noisy. So the outside, I mean, like when you have an air conditioning handler, air conditioning handler on the exterior of your home, it's going to make noise while it's running, right? And you can hear that during the summer months. While the heat pump condenser is working hard to stabilize the temperature in the home, you're going to hear a similar noise on the exterior. But as soon as the heat or cool kind of like achieves your goal temperature, it stops. And if your home is, at least that's, that's been my experience. And if your home is well insulated, then it's going to hold that temperature fairly stable. So if it's like negative, you know, people talk about like it really being expensive if it gets into the like negative 10 degrees. It, it's true because the system, it's going to be a little bit more expensive during those colder temperatures because it's working harder. And as it continues to work, you are gonna hear noise in the exterior of the home. Your okay. heat pump water heater does have a little bit of noise, but it's just a slight hum. And it seems like it's always on. At least that's, what, that's been my experience. Great, thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. And um, I'm gonna introduce our next, uh, our next homeowner here. Yep. Uh, it's, it's Margaret Fogel. She is an environmental scientist and live, lives right here in Newton. And she's gonna talk about her, um, her system with you. So Margaret, you can go ahead and share your screen and, and get started. And don't forget to unmute yourself. There you go. Share screen. Yep. Okay. Okay. Living with heat pumps. I think, I think you hit that play button, Margaret, so it'll get big. There I you go. It. I'm big. Yep. Okay, living with heat pumps. We've been doing that for six years. Um, I was going to give a little introduction to heat pumps. Uh, I think you've done that already. But uh, what we are interested in doing is sharing our steps that we've taken to reduce our use of fossil fuels. And part of that is insulating and, and not letting the heat get out of our house and part of it is using the heat pumps. So I'm gonna start uh, with a tour 
outside the house, going all the way around and showing the locations of our two compressors and the refrigerant lines. And then we're gonna go inside the house, locating the heat pump heads and determining the BTUs that are needed for each head. Then we'll discuss um, heat pump operation at the end. Here's our house. Um, it's a 1927 center entrance colonial with a gas furnace. And I, mm, I just lose the right side of my slide, but it doesn't matter too much. In 2014, we installed these heat pumps. And of course, they're powered by electricity, which is a good start for us. The system consists of a uh, compressor, any, any one system, consists of compressor, which transfers heat from the outdoor or air into a refrigerant, which is pumped to the indoor head uh, where the heat is released. The heat pumps can be reversed to re produce cool air and it does work. Um, in 2015 uh, through 2019, we greatly improved the attic insulation. It was a big job. And we have been working for quite a while on the house air tightness, sealing up the leaks. Uh, we bought a electric water heater. And in 2019, we upgraded the efficiency of the compressors, which I'm gonna go into a little bit more later. By 2020, we had reduced the use of natural gas by 82%. We have many pages of data. We love to do data. So that made us very encouraged to keep going, keep trying to do this, get to 100% no gas. Um, here's our, our 18, thousand BTU compressor it says Fujitsu on it and compressors are this size are about three and a half feet wide and three and a half feet tall and two feet deep and it's required that they be located one foot away from the house. So this compressor serves two rooms on the other side of the house where there is no room for a compressor. Uh, the refrigerant lines for the two heads are in this uh, duct here. Oh where's my well what Okay, they're in the duct. They go up toward the overhang of this room here and go right up to past the second floor window and into the attic. And once they're up into the attic, they go across the attic and out the other side. Oh, um, here we are in the backyard. Um, we have a bigger compressor here. It's 24,000 BTU. And you see that a lot of refrigerant lines are coming out of it. There are three sets of refrigerant lines in and out. So that means we're going to serve three heads. Um, two of the sets extend way up. And if I had uh, a pointer, don't get uh, tricked by the downspouts. <laughs> the refrigerant lines are going up right next to the window. And one of them goes immediately into the bedroom, straight into the head. And the other one goes up into the attic and along toward the front of the house where there's another bedroom that needs a heat pump head. The third refrigerant line wraps around this living room window and goes right into the, the living room and you'll see the head that's attached to the other end of the, these refrigerant lines. I think refrigerant lines are fun. It's a good game to get everything to fit together. Uh, and we think that our installers did a great job. Uh, here we are on the other side of the house. This is where we couldn't get the compressor in. So if you look, aha, now I've got to move this. Um, can somebody move this? Okay, you won't see it. Way up at the top where my head is, the, the duct comes out of the house. And right away, one set of refrigerant lines goes into this bedroom uh, on the second floor. And then it's coming down. And then the other set of refrigerant lines goes right into the uh, dining room, which is underneath there. And if you follow it all the way down, there's a little drip thing for the humidity that's com uh, consolidated in there. Uh, so it works just fine. We have no problem with things going through our attic. Now, locating and sizing heads. This is another thing that's very interesting to me, uh, but maybe not to you. And the installers, if they're good, will get it right. Uh, the BTU needed for a head is based on the room size and the quality of insulation. Well, right here, we followed everything that um, was uh, going to be rebated and to see what we get. We worked really hard on the attic for insulation. 
but we didn't do anything about the first floor walls or the second floor walls. So the insulation isn't that great. And besides, there are very old fashioned windows that are a little bit leaky. Uh, the other thing that's affecting how many BTUs you need for a head is that there's a little obvious rule that however many heads are connected to one compressor, the sum of the BTUs that those heads require has to equal about the capacity, the BTU capacity of that compressor, which is simple. Uh, here's the heat pump in the living room. And for our 12 by 24 room with medium insulation, uh, we needed to have um, 8,000 BTUs head. Works fine. Um, now we are in the dining room, living room. The kitchen is 10 by 12 and it has no wall space for a head. Lots of cabinets, lots of windows, back door, all that stuff. So there's a five foot opening between the dining room and the kitchen. That gave us an idea for the solution. Actually, it was our installer who figured this out. Install a large capacity, 12,000 BTU head in the dining room. There it is right up there. And heat the kitchen by recirculating air from the dining room to the kitchen and back. Okay, here we are with our extra room on the first floor. We call this the sunroom because it has a lot of windows. Uh, it's 14 by 20 and we decided not to put heat pump in here. We get um, some nice passive solar gain in the winter through those windows because uh, the left side of the picture is south. We can also circulate air from the living room because this big um, playroom has uh, two doors into the living room. So far it works. Uh, the plants stay alive and the grandkids stay alive too. They don't need anything more than 55 degrees. When we go in there, we turn on the backup heat, but we're going to get past that. Um, for the bedrooms, uh, we discussed a ducted system for the three bedrooms and the office, which make up the second floor. So this involves a distribution box in a heated attic. And from the box, air ducts deliver the warm air to each room. However, our attic is not heated, cannot be heated, so no ducts. The result is that each of three bedrooms get um, a 7,000 uh, BTU head. And the office, which is connected to one of the bedrooms, uh, gets heat by circulating warm air from the bedroom to the office. Note there's the remote control on the dresser. Second floor bathroom. So bathrooms in general don't have room for heat pump heads. So we had uh, an electric heater, three inches by 14 inches installed under the sink. And there's a sign there on the door under the sink that says electric heater down here. You can't even see it, but um, it works really fast. It warms up the bathroom and it has a, um, a thermostat that keeps it at the right temperature when you want it to. And we put a similar heater in the basement bathroom. Our house is a little weird. A uh, bathroom, a full bathroom in the basement and the second floor and no bathroom on the first floor. We will probably fix that someday. So here's our new electric water he heater. Uh, it's, um, we really needed a new water heater. Um, we didn't really want to um, cool the basement anymore. The basement is very cold, so we didn't want to heat pump hot water heater. And this has no problems. The water is always hot. We never run out of water and it doesn't have an exhaust like our old gas powered heater, um, water heater had. So uh, we think that owning heat pumps is easy. Operating heat pumps is easy. Uh, they can really be turned on and off anytime, whenever you want to, independently. It doesn't matter if uh, the compressor has to make do with one fewer head once in a while, and anytime you can do this. And we just, just to uh, prove that we know what we're talking about, here is the address of the um, person at Fujitsu General America who says, yay, pass the idea around, make sure everybody knows they can turn off their heat pumps on and off. And he's um, really pointed out that th there's such big improvements in heat pump technology that Seven or eight years ago, people were being told, no, don't turn off your, your heat pumps. But yes, now you can. So heat pumps remove moisture. 
And uh, that's fine if you feel that the air is too dry, purchase a tiny little humidifier, it really works. They don't remove that much moisture. Um, for the heads, just clean the fil filters regularly, it takes a couple minutes. And if you're worried about the heat pump heads making noise, that remote control has a lot of settings. Just click on quiet and you can sleep. Uh, what to do next? Well, this is a partial list. We have to get a gas stove, replace our gas stove. We have to replace our laundry dryer. Uh, we thought we can do all our, hang up all our laundry outside on the clothesline, but it doesn't work 100% of the time. And we need new windows and we need to continue with insulating um, our basement and, and sealing the um, le air leaks in the basement. And that is the end. I hope you have. What? Oh, that, no, I didn't. Anyway, so um, if you have any questions, now's the time. Margaret, that was great. I really appreciate it. And I want, to I want to accentuate something that Margaret said about the quality of insulation. It's very important if you're going to start to put heat pumps in multiple rooms in your house that you do all the insulation that you, you know, that is feasible. And uh, MassSave, you know, has a program called Mass Safe Energy Assessments. You can get a link on the Green yeah. website or you can go to any Mass Safe contractor. But right now during the pandemic, since they aren't able to go in and do these in house, in your house, they're doing them virtually. And instead of giving you 75% discounts on the types of insulation they do, they're doing a 100% discount, which means it's essentially free if well, they recommend insulation. So anybody considering a big, okay. you know, don't turn me off yet. I, I forgot one part. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. Okay. And I'm, I'm interested in, eventually we have to do more insulation, but windows are top of that. Okay. So upgrading our old heat pumps. Our original units were installed in 2014. In November, 2019, we uh, had been hearing about new kind of uh, heat pumps that are called cold climate heat pumps. And they're really in like mandated in, in other states that are farther north of here. So we called up uh, Fujitsu and said, can we upgrade to cold climate compressors? And they said, sure. And so we got rid of our old compressors. We didn't have to do anything with our refrigerant lines. We didn't have to do anything with our heads. And we turned them on and they're really better. We did an experiment. We collected the data from before the whole heating season before we got the new compressors and a whole heating season after we did the upgrade. And the data showed a 55% reduction in the consumption of natural gas by our backup furnace. So we think that that'll really be a big help getting us to our, our zero use of natural gas sooner. Now I'm done. Margaret, congratulations on doing all this, and it's great. And anybody who has any questions for Margaret, please type them in. I do have one question here. Is a head the same as mini splits? Margaret was talking about heads. Yes. Yes. When we, yes. When we talk about mini splits, the the air handlers that go either on the floor or on the ceiling or different places, those are called the heads. And as we showed in that, that slide, as I showed, you can have a compressor running up to three or four heads. And Margaret's installation is a mini split installation. And she's got two compressors, each running multiple heads. And that's exactly what that is. Um, Margaret, what controls when the backup furnace is used? When do you turn on the backup furnace? When we're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's thermostatically controlled and we set it um, to something frugal when we, uh, we check the weather forecast every night, you know, but basically we don't have to use that very often. It's just, um, we started out the year before we bought our heat pumps, we were using a thousand and fifty therms of natural gas. And now we're using, uh, the last, um, part of this experiment here. Uh, we are only using 188 therms. So we've reduced our use of natural gas by a lot. And I think it probably uh, is a significant um, savings in money. And uh, we always run our systems in a way that we are keeping ahead of our solar panel production of electricity. And so we think, 
electricity is free. We got our solar panels. Um, does that sound like convincing? <laughs> um, yes. I got uh, one quick one. Thanks for talking about your experience and your energy bills. And did it decrease or increase? I think you already answered the question. Yeah. You know, your total energy, I assume your total energy bills decrease, but. Well, the, the, the gas, the gas char charges are certainly way, way down. However, if you look at your gas bill, a big, when you get down to not using very much gas, you look there and a big chunk of the gas bill is the delivery charge. They're not ready to be kicked out they're going to charge you delivery charges every month. Right. Great. I think we're going to move on. I really appreciate that, Margaret. You can, um, you can uh, turn, unshare your screen and I'm okay. going to introduce our next speaker. Um, so we've already seen a central ducted heat system. That was Chris's system. And we've seen a mini split system with two compressors, each with multiple heads. That was Margaret's systems. And then we saw a heat pump hot water heater which was Chris's system. So we've seen a lot already. Our next speaker we've got here is Bob Zog, and he's very familiar with this technology. He's actually a former Heat Smart coach uh, in the in the Concord Carlisle area, and he's founded a group, co-founded a group called the Heat Smart Alliance. And this is a, basically what I look at it as: if doing a Heat Smart program and being a coach is like going to college. Heat Smart Alliance is like graduate school because <laughs> all the all the Heat Smart coaches that have done programs already are in the Heat Smart Alliance and they get together, they talk about how they can further the adoption of the technology, they come up with models. It's just unbelievable stuff. And I really appreciate all you're doing, Bob. I'm gonna give you the floor, Bob, to talk about um, about your system. Thanks very much, Craig. And uh, Margaret, I just need you to end share screen and I can bring up my slides. There we go. Hang on one second. Okay, hopefully you're seeing a picture of my home. Yes, we are. Um, so I am not in Newton. I'm up the street a bit in Carlisle, not far from Great Brook State Park. My wife and I live in this uh, late 1970s contemporary. Um, it's small by Carlisle standards, so depending on how you count, it's 1,000 to 1,500 square feet. And um, when we moved in in uh, early 2012, we had we inherited the original 1978 oil furnace and 275 gallon tank, and we had no central air conditioning. So for us, it was a slam dunk to put in the central ducted air source heat pump. And um, at that time in my life, I was familiar with the carrier product. This is actually what uh, Chris put in, but this is an earlier version, the Carrier Infinity Green Speed series. Uh, it's actually my wife's idea to put this right next to the entryway. So it's a great conversation piece when people visit. Uh, but the main reason she just wanted to keep it away from the bedrooms. So indoors, we have a, this is the unit that replaced our furnace. It's a single zone uh, system with a 10 kilowatt electric resistance backup heater. So Fuel oil is gone completely. Uh, like any heating system, it has an air filter. Um, and like any central air conditioning system, you have to remove the condensate during the summer. Uh, we don't have a floor drain handy, so we have a little condensate pump here. So I've estimated some performance for you. Now, to be honest, we have a wood stove, but I have fudged the numbers a bit to take out the wood stove. But I think these numbers are about right. And I'm using electricity rates that are the, are the same that you would pay in Newton with 100% renewable electricity under your uh, Newton Power Choice program. So um, our house would normally have used about 470 gallons of fuel oil per year. And uh, the rated efficiency of this heat pump, um, it's rated at 10.5 HSPF, but if you convert that to an efficiency, it's about three. And usually you don't quite get the uh, full rated efficiency. And so we estimate about 2.3 is our actual heating efficiency for the whole heating system. So that brings our electricity cost about $1,600.
Now, if you want to think about how that compares to fuel oil, uh, a break-even price that would give you the same annual bill would be uh, $3.10 a gallon for fuel oil. So uh, by today's prices, that's probably about what you'd pay. Uh, when we first put in the system, we were saving like $1,000 a year because fuel oil was four bucks and electricity was 16 cents. But the good news is we'd make the same decision today because we're saving five tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year with this change. Um, so don't worry too much about this picture. This ice over has happened exactly once in eight years. It happened this March, so I took a picture. Um, conditions were just right to get an ice coating. What can happen more often, because we have a wood-burning stove, our heat pump may not run for a period of time. And if it snows, the snow might pile up on top and it keeps the uh, compressor fan from running. And uh, so once in a while, we've had to brush off the snow because of that. But if you don't have a wood burning stove, you may not have that problem. A couple lessons learned, um, you know, like, uh, like uh, Chris did, the unit should be installed on a pedestal. Uh, ours was not, so once or twice a year, I have to shovel the snow. Our unit uses a fair bit of energy for defrost, and I think uh, you could do a better job. And I think there might even be options available today to reduce the defrost energy. The other thing we learned the hard way was uh, you definitely want to ask for the uh, AHRI certified HSPF, that's the heating efficiency, rated heating efficiency. We were told this is a 13 HSPF and two years after it was installed, I actually looked it up and it's only 10.5. So the sales guys can, uh, can uh, get carried away sometimes. Um, if you're able to, uh, it's good to do a sanity check on the installer's estimate of your heat load requirements. Um, and uh, if you have old uh, fuel oil or natural gas bills, it's not too hard to do that. Our uh, installer, it turns out he uh, overestimated our heating load by quite a bit, but then he also undersized the heat pump, so everything came out right in the end. But I have to tell you, the comfort is the real thing that's impressed my wife and me. Um, we, we generally hate air conditioning. In this unit, we set the air, the temperature at 77 in the summertime, and it's just comfortable, it's fine, we're never cold, it just runs just enough. And the same thing in the winter, um, it just puts out just enough heat in the winter time. It's not, none of this on-off stuff, it just runs at variable speed, it's beautiful. Uh, real comfortable, we couldn't be happier. So moving on to the heat pump water heater, a few years later, we uh, replaced our electric resistance water heater, 2014, with a heat pump water heater. And as you can see, uh, it looks like a regular water heater with the uh, black part on top is where all the heat pump components are. Um, some people see a dehumidification benefit with a heat pump water heater. I can tell you uh, in no uncertain terms that we see zero dehumidification patient benefit. We have a portable dehumidifier that sits right next to our heat pump water heater and it uses exactly as much electricity as it did before we had the heat pump water heater. So I don't advertise the dehumidification benefits much, but some people really do see that. Now just a couple numbers here. Um, you know, my wife and I use about 14 gallons per day per person for hot water. That's probably typical. Some people say 16 gallons a day per person. Um, and looking at the, uh, our product, which is the 2014 column here, compared to a 2020 product, which is what you could buy today easily, you can see the efficiency has gone up dramatically. So that's really exciting news. Um, now, again, here I derate these uh, efficiencies a bit because the, we don't have duct work like Chris does, so uh, our heat pump water heater is taking heat out of the basement. So um, the actual efficiency is probably closer to two, but you would get probably closer to three with a modern heat pump water heater. The bottom line is we're, even with our old heat pump water heater, we're cutting our electric water heating bill in half, and you could cut yours by about 70%, even accounting for what uh, little additional electricity you might need to heat your home. So uh, we've been extremely happy with the heat pump water heater, haven't had a single problem with it. Uh, in fact, we even run it in the efficiency mode, which means the backup electric elements never come on, and we still um, never run out of hot water. 
if we ever had a problem, we could switch to hybrid mode and whatever. Um, in terms of uh, maintenance, there is an air filter on top, and we might vacuum that off once every six months. No biggie, it takes two seconds to do. You know, the only lesson learned I could think of is uh, we intentionally used a plumber who had never installed a heat pump water heater before. I just wanted to prove that any plumber can do this. And he did a great job. The only thing maybe he could have done differently is he ran the um, hot water supply line right in front of the cold air discharge from the heat pump. And now that line's insulated, so it probably looks worse than, uh, than it really is. But uh, that's one minor thing I do differently. And when this wears out, I will put in another heat pump water heater just as quickly as I can. And that's it for me. Well, thank you so much, Bob. That's a ton of great information. And anybody that has questions for Bob, please type them in. I'm going to go back and, and, and to a question that Carolyn asked before. And I think she was talking about air conditioning. And she asked, how does cost of operation compare with a standard, which would be standard electric, not heat pump, AC. And before I, before I ask you about that, Bob, I'll just say that one reason many people get heat pumps is to avoid the hassle of putting window air conditioners in every year, or taking them out. That is just a hassle. They aren't that efficient. They, they're noisy. So that part of it, I'm not sure if that you were asking about. But when you compare like a, stand, like a conventional central AC system to a heat pump AC system, Bob, do you know if there's a improvement in efficiency um, with modern uh, central AC systems? So I'll try to answer it in an apples to apples fashion. So if you were to go out today and buy a new central air conditioner and you want absolutely top of the line, you could get an efficiency that's similar to this heat pump or you know, Chris's heat pump. But, um, you know, uh, so either way, you're cooling costs would be similar and your uh, comfort level would be similar. And this is totally differently than a window air conditioner. It's not even comparable in terms of comfort and noise and comfort. Um, but, you know, our experience is that the, uh, I don't even talk about the cooling energy because it's so small compared to heating. Our heat pump only uses about 10% about of the electricity use year round of our heat pump is for cooling if that much. 90% is heating, so it's really all about heating. And I think that's a good point because people install heat pumps for so many different reasons. And maybe they've got a room in the house that's way too hot in the summertime. It's maybe they've got a room that's cold all the time. It's, they're just so versatile and so many things you could do with them. And that's why heat pumps are really an interesting technology to look at. Any other questions for Bob? Um, I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to thank you, Bob, and I appreciate it. And I'm going to go on to our fourth. I actually have a question for Bob. Yes, go ahead. So, um, so as somebody that has a whole house system, um, would you agree that that's a better choice for a small home and that a larger home should be using um, mini splits so that you can have the experience of, of like a zoned heating and cooling system? I don't think the decision is quite that simple. I think okay. it depends a lot more on whether you've got existing ductwork in the home that's in good condition that you can take advantage of, and we did. Um, and, and by the way, you can have multiple zones. We could have put two zones into our house, but we, we have open architecture and we decided not to do that. Some people put in, um, just like you have uh, multiple air conditioners, you can put in multiple uh, central heat pumps in your home. So that you can get as many zones as you want. Um, of course, it's a little easier to get zone control with the, the ductless systems. Yeah. But uh, I think what the key differentiator is, do you have duct work in your home? Is it insulated and sealed? Or can you insulate it and seal it? And if the answer is no, then you want to look at the ductless solutions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. And I'm going to introduce our fourth and final speaker, uh, John Klein. John Klein's uh, from Newton, and he's a strategy consultant. And, and John's developed a very interesting uh, software tool called the, the Newton Energy Coach. Uh, hopefully, we'll be seeing this roll out to the city of Newton in the next few months or so. Uh, it, it's a great uh, 
tool that we'll have. But uh, John's going to talk about his heat pumps. So uh, John, take it away. Okay, so we'll share my screen. Can everybody uh, see my screen out there? Yeah, you can go into the mode where it fills the whole screen. Um, yeah, I figure I had to do that. I think there's a little yeah, I got it. somewhere. There we go. Yeah. How's that? That's great. Uh, great. So you can see a picture of our house. We're in uh, Newton Highlands on Woodward Street. Uh, our house was originally built in as a one-story bungalow in the 1910s. I think it's either 1912 or 1914. The, the uh, records are a little fuzzy. Uh, the previous owner in the late 80s actually built the second and third floor himself. So he didn't have an add-on. He literally added it on and did all the work. Um, then uh, when they moved out, when they sold it to us, uh, they renovated the entire house top to bottom just before we purchased. Uh, when they did the install or when they did add the second, third floor, there's a gas boiler um, and a hot water tank connected to the boiler. And then when they renovated in 2003, they added central air and they used what are called high velocity ducts. So in older houses like this, where there isn't room to install ductwork, uh, what they have is these little tubes that are three or four inches, um, you know, they're about, about that wide. Um, and they, the air comes through at high speed. So it's uh, less area or smaller ducts, but the air comes in very, very quickly. Uh, challenge with that is uh, it was always noisy. So we liked the air conditioner on the hot days to keep the house cool, but it was always a, you know, it was always kind of a, a mixed experience because of how noisy it was. Uh, the central air, we did have two units. There was one for the first floor and then one for the second and third floor. Uh, so we essentially had two zones. Uh, each unit doing a separate, separate zone. And I think uh, somebody mentioned just a minute ago that you can have more than one central heat pump. Uh, and that's what we have. Uh, so we did do a mass save audit uh, probably about five or six years ago. What they found was the house was well sealed and well insulated. There was nothing they recommended. Uh, so we knew we were in pretty good shape from, uh, uh, from an insulation standpoint. So there's nothing really to do there. So this all started uh, in June of last year when the air conditioner, we fired up the air conditioner for the summer and turned out that the unit on the second and third floor was not for the power of the second and third floor was not working. Uh, we were told that there was a leak in the Freon in the unit and while they could refill it and it would make it through the summer, uh, what would end up happening is the Freon would leak out again. Uh, I think somebody mentioned Freon was banned in 2010 for new units. It's actually banned for replacement as of 2020. So you can't buy and refill it. If you have a Freon air conditioner that needs to be refilled, you now need to replace it. Uh, so that's what really got us started and looking and saying, okay, what are we going to do to replace the air conditioner? And that's where we actually came up and said, if we replace our central air conditioner with a heat pump, uh, that would give us both heating and cooling and allow us to start moving toward electric heating. So that's really how we got started on it. Uh, so I can say it was a little bit of an ordeal. So unlike I think the rest of the panelists who came in with a little more experience on this, I had did not know the difference between, I heard of mini split, I didn't really know what essential system was, I didn't know what the options were. So we went out and looked for green contractors. We called several of them. Uh, one of them returned the call. Uh, what they recommended, even though the entire house was ducted, they said, oh, well, just forget about that. And what you can do is you can put in mini splits into the, uh, into the third floor, and then you can put in new ductwork around the mini splits. Um, and it's not gonna, you know, and essentially I think he had no idea what he was talking about. So I heard that option, I was like, that just sounds terrible. Um, I mentioned it to um, uh, I mentioned it to a friend of mine. He said, "Well, you know, the people you want to call are Rodenheiser." Uh, so we called them up, and what they recommended, and what we did do, was a variable speed uh, central heat pump, and we'll talk about the variable speed in a minute. 
Uh, it automatically flips over to the gas boiler for auxiliary heat, and we'll talk about how we do that. Um, and then they said is, you know, the reason why we have so much noise is that when the uh, last air conditioner was, uh, when the air conditioner was installed, they didn't install enough ducts. So the noise is coming because you have too much air being forced through too, too few ducts. You need to add, I think, six more ducts to the house in order to balance it out. Um, and then the other thing is, is we usually don't use our third floor. So um, all of our bedrooms are on the second floor. Third floor really is for guests when they come. Um, and then we go up there occasionally for some other reasons. So really wanted to separate out the second and third floor so that we could cool it separately. So when, uh, we, when no one was up there, we didn't have to pay to cool it. Uh, so those are the things that we wanted and that's what they recommended. Uh, we then called our current HV, uh, HVAC contractor, and I'll leave their name out of it. Uh, they had been maintaining our systems, our heating and cooling for 16 years. And they basically said, as I said, I'd like a heat pump. And they said, you don't want a heat pump. Like heat pump's not gonna work. It's gonna be terrible. You have no need for a heat pump. Um, later, what I learned was, is that they did not represent an equipment vendor that would integrate with our existing air handlers. And so they couldn't really provide us anything decent. So they just told us, forget it. Um, so what I take away from this whole story is, is that there are a lot of contractors that don't know what they're doing. There's a lot of misinformation and you really have to go get information independently and talk to people who know what they're doing, which is one of the reasons why I think the HeatSmart program is really great because you get somebody to talk to who could help you avoid all the stuff that we went through. Um, so I laid out a picture. Uh, this is my best drawing of our house. So basement at the bottom, uh, floors. Um, you see on the uh, left here is where we have our compressor units. So these are literally the same exact pads, almost the same exact size as the central air conditioners that we had before. Um, because we had already wired the central air conditioners and they use a similar size compressor, or they're actually using the same size compressor, uh, we required no electrical upgrade. So it was able to use all the existing wiring. We didn't have to change anything. So if you're in a position like we are, where you're taking out an existing central air conditioning, there's a very high probability that you will not need any electrical work to get this done. Um, it's also, uh, I think I mentioned before, it's variable speed, so it runs on low. Um, then unless there's a two degree gap between the actual temperature and the temperature you want, or it takes more than 45 minutes to reach the target temperature, it actually kicks up into high gear. And that actually turns out to be really important because um, when it's running on low, it's very quiet. So all those problems we had for years with noisy air conditioner, both between the variable speed um, and the extra ducts, we don't hear it at all. It's only when it kicks into high, which is very unusual, do we actually, um, uh, do we ever actually hear anything and it's not usually for very long. Um, so what you see here, are, these are the uh, small, what I call the high speed ant handlers. These are about three inches across. Uh, we've got 12 on them on each floor. There's a thermostat on each floor and that's connected back both to the um, heat pumps, but also to our gas boiler and it automatically flips over at 32 degrees. Um, the reason we chose 30, and actually it's variable, so we could set it for any temperature we wanted, um, but the reason we set it for 32 degrees is as it gets colder, your heat pump gets less efficient, which means it requires more and more energy uh, to heat your house to the same level. And so 32 degrees for our units is about the break even given current gas prices. So at 32 degrees, it's cheaper to, um, and actually it's really 35 or 36. I had them set at a few degrees lower, um, but at 32 degrees, it's less expensive to run it on electricity. Below 32 degrees, it's more, ex it's more expensive to run it on electricity. So ours flips back and forth um, based, on, based on the cost issue, uh, based on Price. We could reset that. So if gas prices go up, we can bring it down, we can move it up. Uh, what we were trying to do is find a good balance between the two. Um, so 
just to give an idea a little bit of our results, uh, it was more expensive to get the heat pumps after incentives than just replacing our air conditioners. So one of the things that we could have done is just replace the air conditioners we had. Um, you know, in forgetting sort of all of the, you know, I'm, I'm leaving out sort of the emissions part of it for a second. Um, but for that extra 5,000, what we got was a backup heating system. So if our boiler ever fails in the winter, our heat pump will keep us warm. Um, we were able to split the second and third floor into extra zones. We were able to get a quieter system because of the variable speed and the extra ducts. And then we got the five-year $25,000 interest-free loan for Mass Save. And so that actually made up a lot of the $5,000 difference right there. So even though it was a little bit more money, I think we got a lot of really great stuff for it. Um, it is about break even from a cost of operation standpoint. So we have reduced our gas usage about 50%. Uh, but have increased our electric usage by about the same amount. So when you look in our bills, I haven't gone through a detailed reconciliation dollar for dollar, um, but more or less, it's about the same. So our uh, gas bill in the middle of the winter went down about $200. Our electric bill went up about $200. Um, and then if the gas prices increases even sort of 30 or 40% over the 20 year life of the system, it's actually gonna become cheaper to operate. Uh, we have um, reduced our emissions by about 50%. Uh, and the last thing is uh, the system is reliable and comfortable. The only sort of issue that we have is um, the, uh, there are no, uh, we used to have radiators back with the gas system. And when you're running on the heat pump, uh, there are no vents in the second, third floor bathroom. So if you don't leave the door open, you open it up and you get a blast of cold air. Uh, but that's pretty, a minor, that's a minor thing. Uh, this is our National Grid Energy Uses Report. So you can actually see this is our 2019, back when we used to have it all running on the gas boiler. And this is 2020. So uh, more than 50% in February, a little less than 50% in March, more in uh, April, a little less in May, but about 50% over well, all the way around. And uh, I wish I had gotten a cleaner picture of this. Uh, this is a letter from National Grid uh, based on their concern that we had uh, reduced our gas usage by more than 50% and worried that we needed financial assistance. Um, so they want to make sure that they get they keep going. So that's uh, uh, that was uh, that was a funny report to get. So. Um, and then uh, just some things that we learned as first is, is that the trigger event was not replacing our heat, but was actually the air conditioning. So if you have a central air conditioner and it fails, it's an ideal time to move to it. Uh, if you already have an air conditioning central air, there's no need to touch your electrical system. So you don't worry about that. Uh, it really is the wild west in terms of uh, system options and contractors will sell you what they know and have, not what you need. Uh, and then the key things is we found is that the variable speed um, for both the speed and comfort, um, and then actually turns out to be an efficiency issue as well. And the automatic switching back and forth between the boiler and heat pump so we can manage the costs actually turn out to be really important features that we'd recommend, that I recommend. That's it. John, that's great. I learned so much. I just wanted to make, make, be sure that I'm clear that you are using your high efficiency former high efficiency AC ducts for both air conditioning and heating now? Yes. Interesting. You added more of them, obviously, but you're running heat and air conditioning through those. Yeah. So before I think we had nine and they moved it up to either 11 or 12 per floor. I think it's 12 or it either I was at 10 and I moved to 12 or nine to 12. Mm -hmm. I forget exactly what the numbers were, but yeah, those high efficiencies work for everything now. And um, I also want to ask you about the control that you have. Was that an off the shelf system or kind of a custom design system where you automatically switch over to your boiler at a certain temperature? Um, so that was how the system was designed. So actually we used to have nests, which I liked a lot. And this system wouldn't work with the nests. So this is the, it's a Honeywell um, you know, thermostat where that was designed to do this with this system. Uh, probably the last thing to add, I forgot on my lessons learned, which is, uh, so we bought the system and it turned out that we were only the second one of this model that Rodenheiser had ever installed. And so it was supposed to be a one week installation and it actually turned into a two month installation. Um, <laughs> thank God most of that was 
Um, most of that was September and October. So we didn't have a heat problem and the air conditioning was okay. Um, but that was a little rough. I'm surely, and they actually, I'll, I would say as I finally got frustrated enough, I called the president of Rodenizer and he had somebody out there in two days fixing everything and was really great about it. So even though they had a lot of, um, you know, what, what they said and they blamed it, they said, well, the manufacturer told us to do it this way and it turned out to be not easy. And so we need to get the manufacturer and then some of the parts didn't work, but that was, that's all sort of water under the bridge because once it was up and going, it was great. That's great, thanks. And anybody that has questions for John, please type them in. I think what we've heard from a number of people is that the quality of the installer and the installation is really important. And that's one area where we hope to be able to help out a little bit with the Heat Smart program. Um, they're getting, installers are getting much more familiar with these systems. And believe me, there are good installers. There are installers that understand how to do these things right. So um, hopefully we can help point you in the right direction. Is there any questions for John? Or I can open it up to any questions for anybody on the panel or any questions somebody just wants to throw out and let people chime in with what they think. Um, I'm looking to see if there's anything. Don't really see anything else. So, I have a, I have a thought or a question. I'll maybe I'll ask the other panelists. Um, one thing that came up when I, when we installed our, our heat pump system was that certain um, manufacturers operate better at lower temperatures. And I think that's the case, but do you guys have any thoughts on that? I mean, that's why we bought a carrier system. I think it was, they kind of assured us that they were, that they wouldn't seize up or have issues at negative 15 or something was the number. Um, yeah, all, all I can say is it really depends uh, on the, uh, so for the central ducted products, uh, based on what I've seen, the carrier green speed is probably as good as any. Train has some uh, product that's almost as good. Bosch has a pretty good unit. Um, and, and of course, there's other brands that each of these manufacturers sell under, so it gets more complicated than that. But, um, you know, my guess is they're all pretty good. But uh, my guess is that it's, in terms of just cold climate performance, the ductless systems like the Mitsubishi hyperheat line seems to be the one that's very popular in our area is uh, probably got better cold temperature performance. But when you're looking at what's best for your home overall, you got to look at a whole bunch of other factors. And, and, and um, But Mitsubishi also uh, sells a unit that you can put in uh, an air handling unit uh, as well. So I don't know what the performance numbers look like for that. But my, uh, my carrier units, um, you know, it'll run down to zero Fahrenheit. I don't think it'll run any colder than that. And it's, uh, I don't know how much useful heating it's doing at zero, but we don't get that kind of temperature very often. Okay, right, thank you. I got an interesting question. I don't know the answer, but maybe one of the panelists does. What percent of Newton houses now use heat pumps? Anybody have any any rough idea, or maybe Bob and Carlisle? I don't know. Yeah, actually, I can um, I can answer that for you because um, I'm actually on the Energy Commission, and we looked at that when we were putting together the uh, Climate Action Plan. It's less than one percent. It's a couple of hundred. Okay, and we have the goal by 2050 when we're at net zero to have all residences using efficient electric heat pumps. So we got a long ways to go, but you have to start somewhere. You start, you learn to walk, then you learn to run. That's what we're doing with this program. Let me see if we got oh, any other I, I have a question. Oh. Um, can you hear me? Um, somebody said, well, we have to get people interested. And um, I wonder if there are any public places that say students could go into, let's say one room in the high school that was, uh, that had a heat pump head and had the compressor outside. Kids can go in there, you know, it's like a mini library or one lunch room or something, and they can feel the heat coming out of the heat pump and they can see the refrigerant lines going out the wall. And um, maybe they can do um, an English composition on <laughs> how the heat pump works or science. Anyway, someplace where people can go in there and feel warm. 
so, you, so you're you're basically suggesting that we bring this into the schools so the younger younger uh, population yeah. can get familiar with this, and and you know it's a real problem in the industry because most of the people that work as technicians in the heating and cooling industry are older males, and there's very Aha. relatively few young people entering the industry, and it's a it's a tremendous need as we start to grow these new technologies, so. I don't know what we can do with school connections, Marsha, but we'll figure out a way to, to somehow work this into our school connections program. And how about your favorite pizza place? Maybe they put in heat pumps, cooling and heating, and people can sit there and have their pizza and see the heat pumps. You know, I, I, I would say that anyone who has any ideas to help us to educate the community, uh, you can write to me, Marsha, at greennewton.org. Uh, and we'll take all ideas and, and work with the students on it. As I say, right now, I think I'm working with about a 10 young students mm -hmm. who are all eager to help on this education. And the first thing that I ask them to do is to familiarize themselves with the Take Action link on Green Newton's website. And the next thing I ask them to do is to familiarize themselves with the Heat Smart program. And I feel that if, uh, uh, high school students in particular and college students become very familiar with this technology that it not only can help in their future careers, their, wherever they live, uh, you know, how they live a sustainable life, uh, but also to help educate others, to inform their families, to inform their friends. And so uh, it's kind of like when, you know, we used to, when cell phones just came out, we used to call them car phones. Uh, my yeah. generation, so they were car phones and you thought, who needs a, that kind of gadget? You know, we got fine with telephone booths and landline phones and all that. And so this is, you know, relatively new technology. And uh, the same thing with computers. Teachers were not trained, you know, to use uh, computers and look at how that technology is being used in schools. So we do want to particularly focus in on high school students, college students, recent graduates, and help them to become informed. So possibly that's a way uh, somebody like Chris, you know, you're looking to, uh, you know, to uh, inform people in the Heat Smart program. And that's what I guess we could use, find out more people out of the 200 who have heat pumps to uh, help to spread the word. And little by little, you know, uh, we will. I have a, just one more idea. If you have any contacts with people who install solar panels, a lot of people who install solar panels could get hooked on some neat way to use their new electricity, like run heat pumps. So double marketing. So solar panels and heat pump technology is a great combination. And believe me, the solar, solar companies know that because we have a solar company we've worked with for a number of years and I've talked to them about that. They don't normally do the both things, but it is a viable combination, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to thank all our panelists for all the great information. I've learned so much. I hope everybody else has. We will have a recording up on our, um, on our website, which is, you can just type in Heat Smart Newton and get to it in, in a couple of days. And if there's any questions that we didn't get to, you can send them into our email box, heatsmartnewton at gmail.com, and we'll try to get them answered. I'm going to throw this back to Marsha to close it out. I appreciate everybody being here. Well, thank you so much, Craig and Chris, John, Bob, and Margaret. Uh, you did a terrific job. Thank you so much to everyone who attended. Uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, do go to Green Newton's website uh, because it's for you. And uh, a lot of work goes into this. Uh, we're all volunteers, and uh, we welcome your participation in any way, as much time as you can, and uh, people in your family, too, you know, if you're adults with kids. Uh, we don't want kids to feel like there isn't hope, you know, to find climate solutions, and so that's what we, we would like to do, uh, that there's real, there are real solutions that we can stay focused in on, and if we all participate in this as little or as big as you can uh, we really can make this a sustainable community so thank you again uh, and uh, take care everybody stay safe bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. bye now